Yeah, this is John. This is FlintTalkRadio.com, and we like to bring people some, you know, interesting things, and we also like to be bring things that are useful to people. And um, with us today, we have Peanut Butter, and Peanut Butter. Hi, Peanut Butter. Or, hi, John. <laughs> this is Peanut Butter here. And uh, Peanut Butter's got some, um, it has a... Uh, topical uh, oil. T- topical oil. I didn't know how you wanted to word it, because um, yes. when he sat down, he came right in when he started this interview here. Um, anyway, this uh, topical oil, what is, uh, what's, it, uh, what's it used for? Well, there's a lot of people that have used it for a lot of different things. Um, for instance, uh, somebody with, uh, you know, people with neuropathic pain in the extremities have used it. Uh, I've seen situations where people have come back and told me that uh, they put this oil on and, and uh, the uh, neuro- neuropathic pain just went away. Uh, other people have said, well, I uh, put it on there and it uh, reduced substantially. You know, these... Uh, and this is the kind of pain that uh, doctors seem to have such a difficult time with. Um, it feels like uh, somebody stuck their feet into a blast furnace sometimes. It gets so intense. And the doctors prescribe these opiates, uh, the daughters of morphine, the daughters of opium. And uh, it has limited success there in the process of getting physically addicted and destroying your liver all at the same time. And it only partially deals with the pain. This stuff seems to, uh, from what people are telling me, um, has an impact, a very beneficial impact. Uh, it's very pleasant, very pleasant for me uh, to watch someone who has been dealing with this kind of pain for such a long time, and they just looked up, w- look up with a shocked expression on their face, saying, "It's gone. The pain is gone." Uh, I, I, it just brings a tear to my eye every time I hear something like that going on, and and I see that kind of thing happening over and over and over again. And it's not just the neuropathic pains, it's the pains of Crohn's disease, as a for instance. Crohn's disease, somebody wipes a little of that oil on their stomach and it just, you know, the s- swelling is going down. I mean, you can see these people with fist-sized lumps sticking out of their stomach. Their, 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 their digestive tract is so irritated, so knotted up. And it d- it, there's physically a protrusion coming out of their stomach, and you just wipe, they wipe some of that oil over there, and you can watch this this protrusion retracting back into their stomach again and 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 it's just a matter of seconds before they start saying things like you know it's i'm, I'm not feeling the bloating anymore i i, I it, uh, some of the pain that it, the pain is backing down and minutes later the swelling has gone down and and has almost completely disappeared and they're back into their gut again and and the pain is just gone now the ne- pain is gone. Now, the term neuropathic, I mean, that's a lot of people probably not would know what they are familiar with that term. Would you like to go into that a little bit? Neuropathic pain. We're talking about the kind of pain that originates inside of the nerve channels themselves. It's almost a uh, pseudo or a false uh, impression, almost uh, like the nervous system is having a hallucination of some sort. And uh, it's caused by a lot of different things. Uh, a lot of it has to do with... Uh, um, typically, it, it's not unusual for this kind of situation to develop with somebody with diabetes. Mm-hmm. And they've uh, lost a little bit of circulation ability in their extremities. And you have uh, the body, uh, portions of the body, the nervous system is perhaps dying off a Neuro- little neuropathy. bit slowly. Neuropathy? Or that's neuropathy, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, cause that does happen a lot with diabetics. Cause my mother was a diabetic. Certainly. You see this kind of thing progressing to the point where people walk in and have... Um, uh, have to have amputations performed and stuff like that, and but um, all of that stuff is just so horrible and terrible. I, I when I run into these people, and I run into hundreds of people in different kinds of pain and suffering. I'm dealing with the medical marijuana industry business uh, movement, and there's so many sick people, so many people who are in pain, and and I. It's close to I feel these people's pain when I'm facing with them, and I just want to, I, I have this deep need that I want to reach in, and I want to take that pain away from them. I want so badly just to take the pain away. And if I can do just a little bit of that, then I've accomplished something. You know, I just want to take away as much pain in the state as I possibly can. No. What about the oil itself now? Um, how, who developed it? How was it developed? This is my uh, development. I developed this. 
after working on it for a while, the formulation of it, I found something else that was similar to it. That was the uh, holy oil of anointing that w the formulation was given by God to Moses in the book of Exodus. Um, there is one word that was mistranslated in the King James efforts. Uh, it's the word Hebrew word cannabos. The King James folks ultimately wound up translating it as calamus. Calamus isn't indigenous to the Palestine area. It is indigenous to Greece. That's where the Septuagint was translated, which is where the King James folks relied on that document. It was all Greek in origin. The uh, people in Greece, uh, calamus is indigenous there. It grows wild all over the place. It doesn't grow in Palestine. Cannabis was growing wild in Palestine to the point where it was so, it was so common that uh, the name uh, Canaan, the land of Canaan, was named because of all the cane material that was growing in that area. And that was hemp. Hmm. That was hemp, the land of cane. I never put those two together. I mean, I just, that was a... Very, very common in that area. So it's indigenous to that area. It's known by our archaeologists and stuff like that. It was very common all over the place in there. And cannabis, that's the Hebrew word, was used as a part of the formulation of this holy oil of anointing. Like I said, I've never had the guts to make up this pure holy oil of anointing that was listed by God and given to Moses directly. Um, I have a great deal of respect for it. I know of people who do work with that formulation. They've been seeing some amazing results, healing open diabetic sores, things like that. But it's not something that I've gone, I haven't gone there myself. And like I said, I ran into that formulation while I was in the process of working with mine. Now, my particular formulation, I firmly believe that this was a gift from God to me. He led me to the right places at the right points in time to run into the right materials, the right methods, the right techniques to put together this formulation that is, I hope and seems to be, able to deliver the maximum amount of pain relief in areas that the doctors are having the most difficult time being able to deliver relief to, such as these neuropathic pains. That's one category. With Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease is treated frequently by something called Remicade in the hospital. It costs about $4,000 a month for the treatment for that. That the purpose, the primary purpose of that treatment is to reduce a substance in the, in the bloodstream called TNF. It is an inflammatory substance. It's a part of the body's defense mechanism, but it's like when the body goes overboard in trying to defend itself, that it produces these substances that are inflammatory and they are painful. As a matter of fact, one way that this excess substance reveals itself is in the form of rheumatoid arthritis. This topical oil, for instance, at the Medical Marijuana Expo that was held in Detroit a couple of weeks ago, a woman came through, rheumatoid arthritis bad in both knees. She was walking around with a cane, with one of these clawfoot canes, put a couple of drops of oil on her legs, on her knees. She went out dancing that night. <laughs> Nope. Next day, she came back in. She was tugging on this guy in this wheelchair saying, come on, you got to come see this guy. You got to come see this guy. It was fantastic. I, I, I love being able to turn off pain for people. Now, I love it. Now, what is your background? You obviously, um, would, through this you know, interv little brief interview that we're talking about, or talking through already, um, you show like a lot of interest in like scripture. So, I mean, it seems that there's a uh, connection there to like a uh, religious belief. Um, what is your, but you're also very knowledgeable on the, you know, we talked about other things on the outside, you know, before this, uh, before this interview, and you seem to know quite a bit about, you know, herbal medicines and um, alternative me means of uh, healing. You're quite up on a lot of this literature. Um, what is your background? My background. I've worked in chemistry laboratories before as a lab tech. Um, that's some of my official background. When I was young and a juvenile delinquent, I studied drug manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So I became aware, my, the first time I was working with cooking cannabis was when I was 15 years old. I came to, I left those kinds of things off to the side for a couple of decades, taught a lot of Bible to a lot of people, 
ministered healing to a lot of people, prayed over them, taught people how to minister healing, how to do things like that. So and I'm still, it's the desire of my heart to be able to get healing to people. And I consider this herbal medicine to be from God to the people. And I intend to be getting this across to the best of my ability. Now, this topical oil does not rely on marijuana for the majority of its abilities. Okay. It relies on other herbs, and it's based on some of the latest technologies that have been coming through. One of the active ingredients in marijuana that seems to produce powerful anti-pain and anti-inflammation properties is common to a lot of herbs and spices. It's responsible for the taste and smell of black pepper. It's an oil of cloves. Tell me, if you take a drop of oil of cloves and you put it on a toothache, it makes the toothache pain go away. Right. Everybody understands that. What people don't realize is that only just a little over a year ago, last June, it was reported in a scientific study that that compound is a cannabinoid. And it was the first time that it was discovered that a cannabinoid can actually exist outside of the marijuana plant. Wow. Incorporating, using that information to the best of my ability, I began seeking out these compounds that have these cannabinoid effects that marijuana has outside of that and brought several herbs together and brought them into a single oil that is able to be applied. Now, this is for external application only. This isn't for drinking or anything else like that, and there is absolutely no way that you can get high on it. That's not what this is about. This isn't about getting high. I just want to take away your pain. Will you let me please, please, let me take away your pain. Now, like, um, how long did you take to develop this particular, um, you know, topical ointment or drops? It was a journey, a, a path. Um, to get it to the place where it is right now, I would say um, this was about a year worth of work getting to this particular place, chasing down some interesting trails, consulting with uh, traditional herbal remedy people from ancient times because our science is just now catching up with the things that God has already given us or trying to. They're failing miserably for the most part. Decades ago, the pharmaceutical companies were promising to be able to deliver the benefits of medical marijuana without the high. They never accomplished it. I think I have. I want to take away your pain. Now, where can somebody get hold of you to get some of this, uh, this spray in order to, uh, to drops? This oil comes in two forms. The form that I supply is without the marijuana part. I want to help people. I don't want to spend a lot of time in jail doing it. <laughs> okay. Now, this form of this oil is then delivered to caregivers across the state. The caregiver can add the marijuana component, and the marijuana component serves as an activator to the rest of the herbal substances in there. There is just a trace amount of it in there. It does not get people high. It serves to target the pain receptors and transmitters in the body to turn the pain away. That's its purpose. To get it in that form, you'd contact your caregiver, your caregiver supplies you with the oil with a little bit of the marijuana part added into it by the caregiver. This gives the caregiver a great deal of flexibility in terms of the strength for the individual patient where it's needed and to be able to adjust the strain. And strain can be very important in these applications. There are some compounds that are present in one strain of marijuana but not another. And some of these strains some of these compounds called cannabinoids, while they may be very, very important for being able to reduce inflammation or kill cancer cells, they don't get somebody high and they're not noticed by the recreational market. And so frequently, patients who are trying to achieve pain relief by using marijuana miss the target because they're not dealing with exactly the right strain. When you're working with a caregiver who has some knowledge they're able to detect or have some inclination about which strains may be beneficial to you, and the caregiver then is able to incorporate that into the topical oil 
so that this then becomes a topical oil that is customized to your place and time and your situation, what kind of pain you are dealing with. Now, I've got to ask a question. It's probably a lot of people going to be asking. Is like, what do you call this oil? This is peanut butter's oil. Peanut butter's oil. Let's and keep it simple. No, this is peanut butter, and I'm talking about peanut butter's oil. Now, does this oil act, does it have like a, some great effect even without the medical, the medical marijuana aspect, you know, being introduced into it? Uh, would you? Certainly. Okay. Certainly. Yes. There, it has powerful pain-killing properties. Without, without the medical marijuana. And I should rephrase that. Yeah. I should rephrase that. Studies seem to indicate that if you take an, a drop of oil of cloves and put it on your tooth, that the pain will go away. Right. Because it's illegal for me to say, yeah, if you put a drop of clove oil on your finger and put it on your toothache, it'll go away. Millions Jeez. and millions of Americans know that that takes place. They see it themselves personally. They felt it. They know that if they got a toothache, they can put a drop of ambosol on it. But I can't say it helps the toothache. People have said that putting a drop of oil of cloves on a toothache helps. And, and the same thing with your, your product. I mean, if you're putting some of this on your inflamed area, your painful pain area, pain area well, see, it seems to help. It seems to help. People have been telling me that it helps. Let's see, the kinds of conditions that people have been telling me that they've gotten help from. Fibromyalgia, that head-to-toe, body-achy kind of pain. Crohn's disease. Neuropathy, carpal tunnel. That's just a start. Migraine headaches. Migraine headaches. Drop on either temple. Just goes away in seconds. So this is, I mean, and it's like a, it's a great thing about this. It is all natural. There's nothing in here that's going to actually cause inflammation or problems with the skin that you've seen so far, right? Some people have allergies okay. to things. Right. That's true. And everybody, you know, everything. There will be somebody somewhere that has an allergy to that substance. Yeah. That herb, that spice. And that's something that you need to be careful with when you're looking at using this. You try it sparingly a little bit at first just to see if there's going to be a bad reaction to it before proceeding any further. Mm -hmm. You'd use that normal caution before you'd use any before using any kind of spice, especially if you have if you do have allergies, you want to be very careful. Also, uh, there is reference on one of the ingredients, which is clary sage, that it may trigger something with epileptics, but it seems to be in a very small percentage of the cases. But again, and I'm not saying percentage of the cases with my oil, I'm saying percentages of the cases of people having applied clary sage mm -hmm. to themselves for one thing or another, that in a small, very, very small portion of the time, very small percentage, it can trigger something with epilepsy. Hmm. But so far, I have not seen anything. No one has told me anything about that kind of a response. Another ingredient has a warning coming out of California. Um, I think, didn't they just, wasn't there something really silly that just happened regarding labeling in California with, uh, you know, carcinogenic stuff? Um, it, it could be. I mean, they... California seems to be a kind of a, on the cutting edge of lunacy at times. So a lot of, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, that's my opinion. I'm a Midwesterner. I kind of have a dis, dis scorn for the West. I don't know how that far West anyway. Right. But I, no, I don't make, I don't want you make a reference to, but, um, you know, I've heard they got labels that, you know, when you buy products here that California's got on there. And, yeah. In and California, it is known to cause cancer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So don't, yeah, don't stay, stay away from California. You don't get cancer. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Um, but, uh, you know, one of those kinds of warnings um, uh, about uh, women who are with child. Mm -hmm. So if you're pregnant, you want to be very cautious also uh, with this topical oil. Um, but, and those are the only two things that I have seen in literature or print uh, as far as warnings from any of these ingredients. Uh, of course, there's the marijuana aspect of it, and lots of people would say, oh, there's lots of horrible things that have been seen about marijuana, but there's been a lot of studies that have been showing just the opposite. Uh, studies, uh, for instance, 1974, when they did the study and they found out that the active ingredients in marijuana kills cancer cells, they tested it against lung cancer, breast cancer, and virus-induced leukemia, and found out that the stuff killed cancers, these can all three forms of these cancers. Our government tried to repress the information. They actually successfully got it deleted out of some libraries and stuff like that. They tried to hide the scientific information. 
that marijuana may actually hold a cure for cancer if the government would just step out of the way and let our scientists research it. That's, that's, I'm not talking about getting high on a Saturday night. I'm talking about saving people's lives, and I'm talking about taking away pain without getting somebody high. You know, a doctor gives you Vicodin for a, for a, a sprained ankle. You think you don't get high on that? There's an effect. I mean, it's like, uh, let's face it, anybody who thinks that um, the pharmaceutical companies don't rely upon your body's reaction to numbing pain by being enhanced by the chemical you put introducing into it is mistaken. I mean, let's face it, people smoke marijuana for recreational use for an effect. The thing is, why couldn't it, if that effect is like numbing of painful areas or, you know, situations in the body, why is that such a, why is that so hard for people to understand that? It came backwards, I guess, basically. People started smoking for a, you know, recreational use, but they also found that there's actually applications for medicine. Well, they, they, it's a hard thing for the society to make this transition that something coming from a, a kind of a recreational use, you know, which a lot of people have real issues with, and I, I myself, I never used marijuana in my entire life. But let's face it, if it shows to have effect on certain things that are actually positive payoffs for the patients, why the hell can't they use this? I mean, it's just like alcohol is a chief ingredient, a lot of type of topical ointments and stuff like that, and mouthwashes. Let's face it, I've seen horror stories going around here, people addicted to alcohol. It oh. seems, you know, I mean, so I mean, it's just absurd that they can't see the body of work. And I mean, I'm thoroughly convinced. I'm a, I'm a convert because I was totally opposed to marijuana. I thought, yeah, that's they're going to use anything to justify legalizing it about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to the point where it's like, you know, there's some vali- great deal of validity with all these studies being run. And why can't this? Why can't they just drop the attitude and actually start doing really good research and stop trying to impede this? And that uh, it angers me now at this point, you know. Well, there's several things. One, you, you said something about uh, initially it was used for recreational purposes, and then people started noticing that it had benefit for right. inflammation and pain and stuff like that. And frankly, um, that's actually backwards. That is the popular conception. Right. But that's actually backwards. It's been used for 5,000 years for medical purposes for just for things like inflammation and pain and stuff like that. And the concept of recreational uses is actually a rather recent development. Um, so I grew up around this. See, I grew up in the 60s through the 70s and 80s. Obviously. Certainly. And, and it was used recreational then a lot. A lot. Yes. See, it's like we, it's like, yes. Uh, we did lose a lot of the body of information. I'm thoroughly convinced we actually lost um, a lot of church organizations, like, you know, like a lot of the Roman Catholic Church, for example, with the oppression that against, uh, of, you know, dissecting bodies and the prohibition against certain things did impede scientific knowledge growth, you know. For, I mean, that's basically, I mean, I'm a Christian. I don't have a... I don't like attacking Christianity, but a lot of things that developed out of Christianity weren't, it was not based in scripture, like, you know, the, uh, so, the so, uh, solar system, but, you know, they had this idea that it would be wrong, you know, Galileo was called on the car- calling the carpet for saying the earth, earth circled the sun, yeah. and we're supposed to be the center of the universe. Well, nowhere in the scripture does it say the earth is the center of the universe. It says we are unique in scripture because we were created by God, but then again, everything's created by God. So, you know, so a lot of stuff was extrapolated. There was totally an error there. The, the scriptural basis simply didn't exist. You know, that's what it is with a lot of this stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, very few people realize that uh, cannabis is actually talked about in the Bible. I never knew it. Um, it, but there it is in the book of Exodus, but it's just a King James mistranslation that says that it says calamus instead of cannabis, which is what grows there, which grew there in Palestine at that time. Uh, calamus doesn't. It grows over in Greece where the translators were working on the, on the translation. They didn't know about cannabis. They knew about calamus. They thought that was the word, and that's the way they translated it. Oh, just like the so word. we lost some knowledge that was more, so we lost a formulation from God handed to Moses that's 2,500 years or more older, and, and it was used for a purpose of making things clean, to purify things. And if you think of things in the context of biblical times, and they talk about clean and unclean, most, a lot of times they're talking about a medical situation. For instance, lepers were considered unclean. Mm-hmm. This was a substance that was supposed to be applied to all the implements of the temple, all the implements of worship, the priesthood, the um, prophets, and kings became anointed with this stuff during the, uh, as, as time progressed. And it was, and it's amazing that, in, and this was to keep these people and these areas clean. Mm-hmm. Very I don't understand why scientists in our day and time don't take a look back at these ancient traditions and ancient historical sources to see what it was these people were observing 
that made this so important and so central to their worship at that time? Well, because I think that there, there's a tendency in the so-called scientific community to dismiss anything that somebody else did in the you know, past as being just mere superstition. And that's where I think that's, I mean, there's an arrogance there. I mean, we didn't find it, so everything else that everybody else did is superstitious behavior, you know, ritualisms and stuff like that without any substance. And I think it's just an arrogance. I think, that's, I think we all do that. I mean, I think every culture does that when they come into another culture, you know, in contact with another culture, you know. It reminds me of the passage in, uh, uh, it's probably in the book of Acts or something like that, uh, one of the uh, Sanhedrin, they were debating about what to do with this new movement uh, in, 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 with Christians, and, and one, of the, uh, one of the head people in the Sanhedrin sat back and said, well, we should proceed with caution here. If this is something from God, we don't want to find out in the end that we were fighting against God himself. Yeah, it was Gamaliel, and he was the grandson of one of the greatest um, rabbis, uh, Hillel. Yes. And, um, yeah, I mean, let's face it. I mean, another thing is, too, you got to look at Christianity. If some people have criticisms of that, it's existed for, what, two, two, over 2,000 years now. Mm-hmm. And uh, the message, let's face it, I mean, that's a problem. Western, I'm a Western culture fan, okay? I'm a okay. defender of, so I used to do a show on that. And Western culture has its flaws. But the thing is, about Western culture, it does own up to its flaws. It always seeks out information from outside people and stuff like that, and willing to incorporate some of those bodies of knowledges, of the knowledge, you know, from other cultures. And, uh, you know, let's face it, the Jews were really unique in the respect that they actually recorded the foibles of their, of their kings, their leadership, their, pre, their people. Yeah, and so I the think shortcomings, we, their fallacies, yeah, yeah. We inherited that, this, this honesty. Other cultures don't have a tendency, and that comes to the Western culture, you know, part of the Russian tradition, because of Christianity, the fusion between Greek thought and Juda- uh, Judaic thought. And mm-hmm. that's an amazing thing that made this the unique synthesis made this pot, this culture possible. I don't want to go too far into it, but I mean, so I think the bodies of knowledge and stuff like that are a lot. We still have this arrogance or this w- unwillingness to actually look at somebody else's culture having some worth. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, and the irony of it is it yeah. largely comes from the same kind of culture of we largely draw from. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. One thing with this, uh, this formulation that uh, is listed in the book of Exodus, um, depending upon your viewpoint, this formula that's listed there is one of two things. Either it is literally God himself handing this special formula to Moses. That would be a literal translation. Another vantage point, depending upon your faith, would be that this was the result of multiple generations of human trial and error experience that ultimately wound up becoming incorporated into the religious structure. Either several generations of human trial and error experience or directly from God. You know, either one of those is a good thing. Yeah, that's what I have a friend I used to work at the university. He said about uh, morality. Morality, some people want to dismiss because they don't believe in a transcendent God. You know, morality coming from a God up on high, handed down to humans. But he said, basically, if you all look at the teachings em- encompassed, you know, embodied in Juda- Judaic thought, it comes into Christianity, about cleanliness, about the idea about purity, about the idea of, like, uh, abstinence from harmful activities, mm-hmm. and foods and all this stuff. Let's face it. Um, though nowadays, it's, it's been proven that um, men whose uh, sexual par- female sexual partners who are – who uh, having sex with them, I have uh, lower incidence, the females have lower incidence of cervical cancer than the, the, those who are still, you know, uncircumcised. Mm-hmm. So there was a core, they saw the connection. I mean, they saw the connection back then. Now, they didn't have the scientific uh, instruments to say these are microbes or viruses or bacteria or whatever. They yes. just said it's unclean. Clean, yeah, clean or so unclean, yep. yeah. And see, and so, I mean, it's just really kind of bizarre that they want to throw the baby out of the bathwater all the time about morality, about religion. They just want to mock it. And all these teachings are kind of coming along with the, the, the religion, but there's some seriously s- intelligent stuff behind, in, embodied in that, in, you know, encapsulated in that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's almost the kind of thing uh, uh, where um, uh, the um, uh, Gaius is that was that his name that was saying, you know, we should not be, we should take our time stepping in on this. We don't want to be fighting against God. You right. Know? The uh, um, the test of time. You know, the test of time, this, this, uh, these substances, this, this particular formulation for an anointing oil was, um, had withstood the test of time. It lasted up until the time of, uh, well, the idea of anointing is very central to the Christian ethic. Um, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. It's a title. It means the anointed one. 
That's right. That's right. Mel Gibson, when he came out with the movie, you know, the, um, the Passion of the Christ. Uh, I had yes. people ask me in my church, well, why do you call it the, the Christ? And went, for the same thing, I said, oh, see, Jesus' last name was not Christ. It means the anointed. You know, anointed. Christ, uh, Christ and anointed uh, with what? Christmentation or something like that. The, uh, the, some church, the Orthodox Church still has that ritual where they actually anoint with oil. Mm-hmm. Not just water, but with oil. That's right. Yeah. That's I think in the Eastern uh, Eastern um, right. So, and this formulation this formulation consisted of um, it was in an olive oil base, uh, had cannabis in it, it had a couple of forms of cinnamon in it, uh, it had myrrh as in frankincense and myrrh, mm-hmm. and that's that's what it consisted of, and that's and uh, God gave special instructions to uh, to uh, to make sure to use the highest quality known. It says, it, in King James it says, to, oh, I'm not sure, which, there's two different ways I've seen the word translated, either apocryphers, or according to the knowledge of the apocryphers, or according to the knowledge of the perf- perfumery uh, folks. It, it basically, what he's saying is, you know, the highest quality known to, known to science today is that was the science of their time in that category, their chemistry, that's what they had, was they had the, 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 the the apocryphy kinds of people or the perfumery kinds of people. They were, they were diligent and tracking down certain aspects, etc. And God, was, God said, use the highest quality that you know of in the preparation of, these, of this oil. And of course that would make sense because this is a holy oil intended for uh, spiritual purposes and, and for purposes of, of cl- making clean and uh, so having, you know, the, the, the idea of, of giving the best for God's purpose is, rings clear in that passage. No, okay, well, getting back to the product that you, um, you're, you create, you created, yes. um, where can people get this, where they can contact you so they can get it? Um, get, get, like I already asked the question, it was, it was it's still largely effective without the uh, medical marijuana, oil, and, you know, tinctures, whatever, added to it. Where can they get hold of you so they can get hold of some of this stuff to try it and, or use it? Or where can they get hold the thing of to do is to contact their caregiver. Okay. If their caregiver does, isn't aware of it, then have them contact the uh, Michigan Medic or have them contact their compassion clubs in their area. Okay. I've been trying to uh, have a contact uh, opened up for all of the compassion clubs in the state of Michigan because my intent is to take away as much pain in this entire state as I possibly can. I consider myself to be working on a mission from God, a mission of healing, and I want to heal as many people as I possibly can in this lifetime. No, it's like, um, okay, now there's going to be a lot of people. This is the Internet. It goes up on... Um, People are going to be outside of the state of Michigan. Um, do you, are there? Do, are, does every state have have some kind of formal compassion club? Maybe they can contact. Or? Every state? No. Yeah. No. This so is a Michigan product for okay. Michigan people. Okay. And if people want it outside of Michigan, you have to ask President Obama to change the situation a little bit to make that possible. Or you can come maybe here to get the treatment, maybe or use oil. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. yes. They could come here and pick up the untreated oil that didn't have the cannabis part they could probably take that back with them technically it would be if they if push came to shove it could be defined as paraphernalia i suppose unless the person intent intended not to add a marijuana component to it and it's it's useful as in that form also Uh, not quite as effective i don't think um but uh even so uh, this is this is it's the federal situation, right. and that's why I'm tr- trying to keep. And that's why I'm saying this is this is a Michigan product for Michiganders. Mm-hmm. Michigan for Michiganders. No, it's like uh, you know I like to I like to see where you know eventually there's an easing, and I think Bob Brown has already said basically a lot of the drug cr- offenses. His his um his uh, justice department said it could be as uh, you know as uh, vigorously pursuing or prosecuting as uh, other previous administrations. So, I mean, as much as I don't like Obama, I don't like him for a lot of things, I can see him, I can see him with his health care thing being, being taken a, creating a fiasco and all this other stuff. But I don't like, I don't, I don't like the idea of what he's got, I'm not the way he's going to run it. Um, and I have a problem with government running anything because uh, I've never seen them do anything pretty well anyway, so. Oh, do, you, do you have an inherent distrust of government? Yes, I do. It's like, it's, Isn't you know, that amazing? Yeah, it's like yeah, it seems like if you want to find a way to make something as expensive as possible, just get the government involved. Well, yeah. They'll, they'll, um, and, and this recent series of things that have been taking 
taking place. I, for instance, have the the bank bailout that was taking place that started out under the Bush administration and carried through into the Obama administration. And there was a lot of bankers that got some pretty big piles of money. Right. I, I didn't see any. I, my pockets didn't become inflated. Um, and uh, I heard stories about bankers going out and throwing really lavish parties and spending millions of dollars on parties and spas and stuff like that to celebrate having this extra taxpayer money put into their pocket. And then the car companies had a problem, and I understand there's people working and stuff like that, but you know there was a lot of money that was given to the car companies. And, and then they had this little program called Cash for Clunkers. Mm -hmm. After spending trillions of dollars, handing trillions of dollars to these companies and stuff like that, they finally got around to actually handing some money to people, and it was at first limited to $1 billion and then expanded to $2 billion in contrast to the trillions that were given directly to the companies themselves. Now we've got a situation where w there's this huge bill uh, that, they're, that they're talking about, and I'm supposed to trust my government that all of these trillions of dollars that they're talking about spending is going to be benefiting patients, but I know that the checks are going to be written out to doctors and drug companies and hospitals and things like that. Yeah, I, so I mean, I'm there isn't going to be any checks written out to individual people. This is money that's going to be going to these to doctors and hospitals and pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, and that's that, that's trillions. That's, that's the reason dollars. why I have an issue with that. It's reason why um, it's not because I don't care about the poor and the suffering and all that. I mean, but I, I mean, if they're going to be served, they're served fine. We could do some, but we also got to eliminate a lot of the federal, the federal government's aggress going to other countries. I mean, we're buying our friends. It doesn't seem to work that well because I talk to people on the internet from other countries and they hate us. Okay, so and, and these countries they're living in are getting billions of dollars a year from us. You know, we're basically making our own people slaves to these other nations, paying tribute to them because there's no way we can slice this. Help the other be in tribute to these people, and if we just start folding that back into our own economy, just a portion of it, you know, uh, we'd have a strong, viable economy with a lot of a lot of Absolutely. people getting their needs met because of the economy functioning as it should, instead of just throwing it away. And we're throwing billions of dollars a year away for friends who are not who are. Let's face it: once you cut their funds off, they're no longer going to be even friendly. So I mean, they're not that good of friends, and we're not getting anything out of it. You know, I mean, simply, I mean, just no bang for buck on this. So Certainly, you just you know clo close down all the overseas uh, uh, aid. Um, if we're not taking care of our own people first, then why is the money being sent overseas when we have our own people to take care of first? This is our tax dollars that are being applied in these situations. It makes much more sense to keep the money at home until we make sure that our own Americans are taken care of. Yes, there are people in other parts of the world that are in dire need. But to take money from people in need here to give it to somebody else to help relieve their need over there doesn't make sense. And the people in the United States right now are in need. Right, exactly. This is a tough financial time right now. This is a tough financial situation that we're going through. Rough, e rough economic times. We've got these health care issues, unaffordabilities, and stuff like that. Yes, those are there. So stop taking our money out of our pocket and let us help ourselves. That's exactly. Okay, I don't think I can stop giving it away to somebody else overseas when we need the help here now. Right. I, I can't sum that up any better. So anyway, um, any do you want to give out any personal contact information out now during the course of this interview so people can contact you directly, perhaps, or? I can be contacted through the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association website. And this is peanut butter? This is peanut butter. And, and uh, you can just click on my profile. You can send me an email. Ask me what questions you will. Um, and please, like, I've been, like I said before, I want to take away your pain to the best of my ability and to the best of what God can give me to do that with. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much for coming in, and I appreciate this conversation thank we you, had. Thank you, John. And have a good one, okay? God bless. Can I pray for these people out there? Sure. Heavenly Father, I'd like to thank you right now in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. I'd like to thank you for all the people across this great state that are in pain right now. I'd like to thank you for this oil being able to reach out and just take some of that pain out of it, draw it out like a magnet, and just throw it out on the ground. I'd like to thank you for their hearts and lives. I'd like to thank you for relieving the financial situation in this state. I'd like to thank you for that opening up and this recession just being driven back. But mostly I'd like to thank you for taking away as much pain as is possible to take away in this state. And thank you for that. In the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. Have a good day. You too.